Podcast, the main podcast for the business magazine for men.com. In our podcast, just like in our magazine, we're focused on promoting women's voices in business, technology, STEM, politics, sports, arts, and culture. My name is Monica Antohi. I'm the founder of the business magazine for men.com and today's host. Today's conversation is about the impact of sexual abuse, the reverberation of a malicious act against a trusting child that will impact the life of more than one person. Today, we'll be talking about detours, about the detours that we all take, unwanted and unexpected, that propel us in directions that we never thought possible or reachable before the detouring events. Today, we're speaking with Amy Ostriker. She is dubbed the detourist, the light that just won't quit, the bright spirit that fought a massive comeback after sexual abuse, trauma, months long coma, 27 surgeries, a stomach explosion, loss of speech and loss of movement, and all starting at the fragile age of 17 and all before the Me Too movement. We'll talk about PTSD and art therapy and how trauma lives within the body and emotional healing as well as mental health. Amy is a TEDx speaker with multiple talks. She's an inspiration for all of us that find life too difficult sometimes. She's making all our lives better with her musical theater pieces with which she's now traveling the country. They are educative pieces that speak about rising from the ashes of abuse and getting what you want in this thing called life. Stay with us as we speak with Amy. But before I get to the podcast, just a quick reminder. We're now a project at ifundwomen.com, the crowdfunding platform that is helping women entrepreneurs and female founders raise the capital that they need to stay in business and thrive. Head on over to ifundwomen.com forward slash projects forward slash business dash magazine dash women and support us in our commitment to bringing you amazing stories about the wonder women of every industry and help us provide this and the next generation with women role models that will impact every aspect of our lives. Thank you for your generous support. Now let's get you to today's conversation with Amy Ostriker. Hi, Amy, and welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Let's start with you, Amy. Who is Amy Ostriker? That's a good question. Um, I am kind of a, a creative artsy type. Um, I'm pretty passionate about everything, and I think that was kind of what only, you know, not only helped me survive, but helped me, you know, make something out of what I've been through, which I think is the key to anything, a little, a little creativity. Um, but, um, you know, you mentioned detours um, because I'm – Kind of grateful for these detours in my life that have taken, you know, what re- originally started out as, um, you know, I grew up in musical theater, and um, that was that was the set plan for my life. Um, I was pretty driven as a teenager, and I had a clear focus about what I wanted to do, which was just uh, theater. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, I had a voice teacher. Um, who I really, you know, trusted and looked up to. And, you know, two years later when I was 17, he started molesting me. And I, you know, I went into complete shock, um, obviously, with something so devastating as that. Um, And I don't, you know, even remember anything I was thinking at the time. I just remember feeling very numb. And then, um, you know, months later, I finally, you know, told my mother what had happened And that was the April of my senior year. And then, you know, we were planning on, you know, getting therapy and all these kind of things you would do at something like that. And then um, two weeks later, I just had a really bad stomach ache that didn't go away. And um, everything escalated very quickly. Um, You know, my dad took me to the emergency room um, just, you know, for an x-ray. And I guess I'd gone septus. And... Um, if I had gotten to the emergency room like any later, uh, the fluid would have gone to all of my internal organs and I would have died. And so um, the, my stomach just literally it hit the ceiling of the operating room and when the surgeons cut into me. So it literally exploded. Yes, it, it did. And I was in a coma for months, um, you know, and someone who had been healthy, you know, her entire life. You know, I woke up months later um, from a coma, yeah. um, and um, the surgeons told me that, um, you know, and this was, you know, still my senior year of high school, theoretically, 
But now all of a sudden I had no stomach anymore. And not only that, I couldn't eat or drink. And they couldn't even guarantee if that would ever happen. And so talk about waking up in a completely new reality, like, you know, the twilight zone, like what is going on? Right. And I remember besides obviously being devastated at all of that, you know, shock at once, you know, part of what I loved most about being a performer was that was how I connected to the world. You know, that was my life force, um, like giving back that, you know, it was how I felt like I made my contribution. Like I remember feeling that way at a very young age, like, oh, this is my place in the world. And, you know, what do you do when you're suddenly kind of kicked out of your place in the world and everything you knew? Um, so I think the biggest devastating thing to me was, oh, my God, like, I'm not going to be relevant anymore. You know, and I was petrified that at 18, right. I was going to be a has-been, and that was it. You know, in in the ICU, just even just physically, just like lying in this isolated bed it's like all of a sudden just you're tucked away from the world you know um and so I think that kind of filled me with this really kind of manic drive to just keep creating and find some way to feel vital um because it was very easy to just kind of actually it wasn't easy for me but you know to just kind of lie there um and I just I couldn't do that um, you know, I think because I've been like a, always a productive type, it also helped that I had like a really supportive family around me all the time. Um, and so, you know, being in the hospital was one thing, but you know, I was discharged months later because I didn't really have a diagnosis or a certain illness. I was just kind of this, you know, person that had this stomach rupture. So, you know, after a few months, I was medically stable. And they um, sent you home. Yeah, but the, the thing is that I didn't have a stomach. Um, yeah. so, like, so they basically said, okay, there's really no reason for you to be here. But And I was sustained on IVs to, for nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, there's really no reason for you to be here, but, um, you know, you still can't eat or drink anything. And we don't know you know, when that will happen. So just like, you know, check in with us every day and, uh, or, you know, every month or so, and, and we'll see what happens. So that was awful because I really had to learn the art of taking it, you know, day, one day at a time. Like I literally could not think about the next day. And so that's where, you know, I learned, um, you know, what I call now or like my hardcore, like survival strategies, which later turned into things just, that helped me navigate, you know, the detours of everyday life. And the biggest thing for me was the idea of hope. Um, I definitely learned a new thing about hope that it's not this just like inspirational beam of light that comes to us from like a mountaintop, you know. <laughs> it's actually an active thing that we have to cultivate. And sometimes hope is really just lying yourself, you know, as much as, you know, it's weird to say it like that. Um, it's whatever it takes for us to get from day to day to not think about the big picture because sometimes we just can't. And like an example for me, you know, it turned into six of the past 10 years and 27 surgeries. Um, you know, That's a lot of surgeries for a little body. It is. It is. Um, and, um, are they all stomach related? And and because well, I've, were I've all, seen your TED talk and well, um, they were all to kind of reconstruct my digestive system, and eventually they were able to take whatever intestine I had left and make like a little pouch, almost like a gastric bypass. But you know the point is, like if you had told me out of the hospital, okay, now you're going to wait six years before you can have an ice cube, you know, I would have wow. just in the towel right there right you know yeah. you threw by you know, I literally got through by you know I would um I got like a big like countdown board and I would write like seven days so I can eat again six days five days and then when I got to zero I'd like start it again and in my head I knew like I wasn't a doctor you know I didn't know what I was saying but like I also knew like okay my only job is to really just get through today 
And, and that's what, you know, you talk about, you know, you hear mindfulness all the time and the importance of it. And it's not just like for fun. I mean, it, it can make life better, but you know, it can also be hard to like sit with where you are now and not had, but you know, it's, it's what gets you to, you know, and, and again, you know, talking about like business and things, um, you know, imagine like I was set to go to college. I had just gotten my college acceptance letters and I had a plan for myself. And for a while, you know, it's funny, um, Facebook was actually in, like came like to be like while I was in a coma. So I remember like coming out and like my friends came over and visited me after the hospital and um and they set up like a Facebook account for me. I'm like, what are you doing? I don't want to be on this thing. Right. Um, but, you know, and then it just, you know, I ended up just not using the internet for years because it got, you know, I would start just like looking at all my friends' lives oh. and seeing like, oh, okay, they, doing and they went to college, they got a job, you know, and, and I would think to myself, oh my God, like, because the whole thing was like, without a digestive system, you know, food is such a social thing. Like I had to isolate myself for years. And so like I was just struggling for years of feeling like a person. So I think for years I just went on a quest to be like, okay, how do I become a person again? And so I would look at these you know, other people and be like, oh, I'll know who I am when I get a job or I, I know who I am when I get, go to college. Right. We're all like, associated, associating ourselves with what we do. That's how yes. our society has right. and with created the, us, basically. That's what I realized. Like Once I finally got myself together, I realized, wow, it wasn't just because I was in a coma that I was thinking that. That's kind of like what everything one thinks. And then years later, I realized, wow. Like, I have my stuff together even a bit more than some people I know that did go to college and did get a job. You know, it's, I realized that there's not one path for anyone. And I also realized that really, you know, finding your calling really starts from just being present and, and being a detourist, which is someone, you know, who's had a detour in life, which we all have, doesn't Absolutely. have to does not have to be a life-altering trauma. It could be, you know, just a new job we didn't expect to learn something from or or anything. Um, but if we accept that and embrace it and try not to think about, oh, you know, you know why me or where is this going to take me? I mean, it's natural to think that, but, you know, to still put one foot in front of the other. You know, slowly, like I never could have told you years ago that, you know, I'd be doing what I'm doing. Um, but somehow it still brought me full circle. Like I think the biggest example of that that I could have never anticipated is, you know, I knew my entire life I wanted to do theater. I, that was my life force and I couldn't think of doing anything else. Well, that's what you're doing right now. But how did you get there? Like how well, did you go surgery after surgery with the possibilities like of recovering or never recovering right. very present there? How do you and, just go through that every day and still end up, you know, yes, a few th a few years later, but you end up doing what you've wanted to do. Right. Well, more than a few years later, right. I, you, know. you know, when I woke up from the coma, you know, I, I couldn't talk for a long time for, you know, a year I couldn't walk. And, you know, I was such a dancer beforehand. Um, I was, you know, I thought I'd never be able to dance again. And I remember. It's devastating for, you know. Not yeah. being able to talk and not being able to walk, let alone, like, try, I mean, those are massive things that affect you on a very deep level. And I'm, I want to talk a little bit about that later, but you're not able to dance. You're not able to do any of the things that drive you. Right. And, like, I remember, like, my whole medical team was so concerned about, like, survival. And, like, I was like, wait, like, why aren't you even caring that, like, I can't even point my toes anymore? Or, like, you know... It's like the doctor disconnect where I, or the nurse would be like, oh, so you were a dancer? And, like, I was 18. I didn't want to feel like I was at, like, my funeral. Right. I said, no, I still am a dancer. Like, and I think it was that mindset that helped me. But, but anyway, for a while, you know, I couldn't do any of that. And then actually a month after I got out of the ICU, um, you know, it was – it was a very hard time because all of a sudden we were kind of kicked out of this world that we had somehow made a home out of. And now it's like, okay, start now. 
you know, and I hadn't, you know, first of all, we moved into a brand new house. So, like, everything was different. Oh, yes, your parents had moved while you were in the hospital. Right, right. So it was like I couldn't even find anything to recognize myself. So I saw that a local theater company was having auditions for Oliver the Musical, and I was in such bad shape. You know, I was yellow from the IVs. I had, like, a bag, bag all over. I'm like, let me just, like, try out for it because – you know, it'll probably be a good community thing for me to, like, be in the chorus. Were and you walking at that point? Hardly. <laughs> hardly. Yeah. And and I was on IVs and all that stuff. And so I just, like, sang. And I hadn't, you know, my brothers are actually musicians, so they would come to the hospital every day. And, you know, we'd they'd play guitar and I'd sing. And, you know, it took me a while to even be able to emit, like, noise. Um, but, like, I, I, like, just belted out when I got to the audition, like, this rail thing. It came out. And, and I remember walking in and be like, wow, that was good. And then they ended up unbelievably giving me the lead, which was the craziest thing. And, you know, they double cast me just in case because they didn't know if I'd, like, fall over the yes. next day. <laughs> But that was such a good experience because, first of all, you know, and I, you know, you can read this about trauma that um, you know, theater is such a community experience, and you know, healing from trauma is really, it's really a society effort. Like we need, we can't heal in isolation. We need community, and we need that compassion. So I think right out of the hospital, that was a very good thing to have happened. But anyway, how my what I'm doing now is um. You know, to cope during, that was rehearsals at night, which is a great experience for me. But to cope during the day, you know, I couldn't even have an ice cube. I locked myself in my room and I just journal for hours just to not even like to process things, just to pass time. Because I had to make it, you know, what do you do during a day when you don't break it up with meals? Right, or water. or school or... But it was, yeah, besides that, it was like a constant mission to not feel anything. Because How hungry were you doing that? Just oh, to... I was starving. And what was kind of the most annoying part was the whole kind of doctor disconnect that they would say like, oh, you're getting thousands of calories from the TPN, which is the IV fluids. Like, you shouldn't be hungry. And, you know, <laughs> as if... <laughs> No psychological component at all. And especially in the heat of summer and no water. Um, so I actually became, and this is where the creativity was really, you know, a saving grace too. But, you know, you become obsessed with, with what you don't have. So I actually was so obsessed. First of all, I would lock myself in my room and also just watch the Food Network all day, which was kind of torture to <laughs> Oh my goodness, that I, is torture. <laughs> well, it's like a horror movie where like you can't look away, right? But then also like I found myself, you know, I I really I can't even explain it, but I needed to be around food. It's just a human thing. So I actually started a chocolate business so I'd have an excuse to buy candy. And once I did that, it was just a great way. And that's how I realized that one of the first times I realized what creativity can do because it was like an active thing that I could do that I could feel purposeful you know I could say I was doing a chocolate business and like I was able to not it's kind of a metaphor for feeling after trauma like I couldn't numb out to the food like I was present with it just like you know you can't really numb out to your feelings and you have to find ways to be present with it right. but I found like a safe way to do that and I think that really helped me but but back to the journaling, um, you know, I had journaled thousands of pages during that period. And, you know, years later, almost 10 years later, um, I would take those journal entries and put together dialogue and, you know, put 16 songs together and make a 70-minute musical about my life. A uh, gutless and grateful, and, and talk about you know talk about business uh, ideas in the but, middle of. And, but even that, is, even that is so interesting in how that evolved, because my I never thought that I'd be doing all this stuff. To be honest, my intention was I wanted to put together like a little cabaret act, and I wanted to sing, and I wanted to be back on stage again. Um, I thought even on a local level, I somehow I got the nerve to call like a big theater in New York and have my debut there. 
And it's so interesting because, you know, I've been on the news, but I had never told the story from my perspective. I mean, now I'm doing it all the time, but in 2012, I hadn't talked about anything. I don't think I had even processed it for myself. So it was a big risk kind of just like getting out there and In front of everybody, yes. But what I didn't realize was telling my story, you know, people could actually relate to what I was going through. Like I wasn't just like this freak girl whose stomach exploded. And so then I realized, you know, people started lining up and telling me their stories. And I realized like, wow, like we actually heal. Like it's a transformative process to actually just tell our stories. Yeah, um, and so, so that's what inspired me to transform the program into first, you know, to colleges as like a mental health and sexual assault uh, prevention program um, where, you know, where oh. it's all about getting people to tell their stories and I'm doing the show and then, you know, I'm doing a discussion of you know, what it was actually like and the, you know, the skills for resilience that helped me. Um, and, um, and that kind of evolved to me getting very into psychology and wanting to learn the why, uh, behind, um, you know, what I had been through. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that kind of led to, you know, really a passion for expressive arts. You know, I got another thing is I got very into visual art from all this. Um, and you know, art therapy. Yeah. Um, and but so wait, wait, before you get to art therapy, um, how'd you become the PTSD? How'd the PTSD um, conversation come into play? Well, I had been Were you diagnosed with PTSD. I don't even, I wouldn't even say that cause I never really saw a therapist, but, um, or, you know, one that I really spent much time with, but, um, you know, I oh. felt crazy for a long time cause I was just, you know, triggered by things and, you know, and like, I just thought like, oh, because of what I went through, no one will ever understand me again. And I think, you know, all my kind of education was kind of like self-service a la carte kind of thing. And I realized when I recognized these things, you know, a big book that helped me was Waking the Tiger by Peter Levine. And I realized that, wow, you know, trauma actually lives in the body. You know, it's not something we can think ourselves out of. So I think I just started really getting into that and really, and identifying with a lot of, um, you know, what was written about it. And that was also a good thing because I also learned about post-traumatic growth. And, you know, actually one of my favorite books, it's pretty recent, The Upside of Trauma by Jim Rendon. Um, reading <laughs> For everybody listening, we'll have all the links at the bottom yeah. of the podcast. <laughs> and um, reading, you know, it's, it's a wonderful book of all different examples of people that have, you know, military veterans, um, people with cancer, you know, so many people that have been through such difficult times, but they all felt the same, like, oh, you know, it's funny, but I'm actually grateful for this because it actually has made me, you know, such and such to find like a community of people that felt that way was such an eye-opening experience, you know, because it was like pointing at a diagnosis, like, yes, like, that's what I feel. Like, I feel these great gifts in my life now because of that. So it, it was a really eye-opening experience for me. Got it. And, and I'm, uh, you know, talking about how you went from dealing with trauma and, uh, you know, and, and coming out of it. It's like... You've gotten a bunch of really sour lemons and you've turned them all into sweet and refreshing lemonade the best you could, but you know, and that, that alone is the definition of don't give up. Um, exactly. one of my favorite quotes ever is never give up, never surrender from galaxy quest. But <laughs> I believe that you're actually the embodiment of that. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, um, it's true. You know, you just got to get from one day to the next. And that's really our only job. It is your only job. Take us a little bit through your business journey. How did you end up getting to be a TEDx speaker, an award-winning health advocate? And um, you said you have a program that you're, you're trying to teach right now in, in colleges. Let's talk a little bit uh, from that point of view. And I like to talk about the uh, playwright and the actress part as well. Um, but let's stick a little bit with the, with the business part right now. Yep. Um, so, I mean, that all came together. Like, I, I didn't expect to go down that route. But again, it came with the power of storytelling. And I think the biggest revelation for me was learning that what I'd been through was really relatable. 
um, that you know, even though what had um, what I had experienced was you know extreme the emotions, you know, the pain, the anger, the frustration, you know, those are all things that we go through, um, and that you know we can bring people together um, by the power of you know a story. And um, and find that commonality, and you know, especially with the mental health field, how stigma is such an issue. Um, I realized that we were kind of just creating barriers for ourselves when we when we tried to, you know, speak our truth through. Oh well, I've been through this, and I've been through that. You know, in um, you know, I found that when I started introducing the detour concept, I found that a room would just like melt because all of a sudden you know you had people that were going through a divorce or people with a chronic illness or you know people that are struggling with all kinds of physical and mental health obstacles able to you know start from the ground up and and i realized on my own that you know we heal through compassion and really that we can't heal w without it um, because, you know, secrets really keep us sick and we need to find ways to express what we've been through. And that is so instrumental in the healing process. And then I started reading studies about that and it, and it all came together. So I think, you know, framing everything as a detour, that's not to minimize what we've been through, but, but it's a way to really start on like just a common playing level where we can all kind of find that empathy that might be harder to identify with. Um, so that, and also just a big instrumental part of my healing process was creativity because creativity is also a wonderful way to express things, you know, that we can't always put into words that Correct. also resonate with people on a more common level. Um, Cause sometimes words don't do it justice and we need to find ways to find, you know, safe ways to be with our feelings without kind of running away from it. And I think creativity is like a safe container. So anyway, all these kind of scattered revelations at once came together for me in like you know, the presentations and workshops I'm doing. And you know, I never thought I'd be using my show, which just started as musical theater as like kind of a, a vessel, you know, to convey that, which is great. And I'm also working on my book now, which is, you know, a surprise title, but part of it is my beautiful detour. Um, and, and um, you know, and hopefully just, you know, taking it one day at a time and seeing where this leads. And, you know, like you mentioned, like, I love doing these mental health presentations and being in this field. But first and foremost, like, I, I'm an artist, you know. I'm an actress. Like, that's where I started. So that's kind of what my general movement is, you know, towards once again, you know, because, um, you know, it's been over 10 years and I think the next chapter in my life is to, you know, getting all this out was a big part of my healing journey. And now I'm looking Absolutely. forward to kind of going back to just like, you know, the actors where you could uh, know me and, and know a bit about my story, but it has nothing to do with uh, what I'm doing now. And I, and I think that's kind of the path that everyone takes where, you know, you might have gone through something and hopefully you'll use what you've been through in order to heal and in order to move on. And then that will always be a part of you. But, but it, you know, but you'll have done that healing and sharing you need in order to move forward. Got it. And um, P your PTSD t tangent is super important to me because um, I talk to you Everybody that I talk to, actually, I encourage to go see a shrink in their lives at least once or a couple mm -hmm. of times. It's um, talking about mental health in, this, in, in the United States and actually in any English-speaking country, um, it's, a, it's kind of a taboo. Um, yeah. We need to overcome that. There's a lot of people with a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of trauma, a lot of issues and that have piled up because nobody's encouraged them to speak like you were or express them out through right. like you have you found your healing path through um your art through your um through your playwright through acting through basically you've expressed it out it, you're dealing with it that way there's a lot of people who can't do that who don't have necessarily those tools so i i, yeah. I encourage everybody that i meet to go see 
um, a, a psychologist once in their lives. It's 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 that it's important. It's so that, important, and it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, absolutely, and and that's the biggest you know hurdle um, when you talk about any sort of mental health issues is the fact that um, they don't want to go see a psychologist. Nobody wants to go see a psychologist because it's implying that there's something wrong with you. Well, hopefully, hopefully we're taking away that stigma. Um, you know, because I think people are coming forward more that, you know, healing is just as natural a process as learning and growing. And, you know, we all deserve to, to hear it, to be validated and to hear that. You all deserve to have a good, productive life. And to have a good, productive life and to be happy, it's, it's, a, it's a written in the Constitution. Um, you have to be able to be okay with who you are inside. So find a way. If you're, if whoever's listening to this, our listeners, find a way to, to listen to that, to tap into that and express that out, however it comes out, through art or seek a therapist. Um, and the, the biggest, the biggest takeaway is you don't need to be an artist to, to make art. You Absolutely. know, creativity is a mindset. It's just a way to get yourself seeing things differently. So you know, put on paper and rip it up. You know, no one's judging. But that's something I'm very passionate about. That we all have the right to create. Absolutely. So um, let's let's get to the point. Where, what are your pointers? <laughs> what kind of pointers you're trying to uh, you, you can give our audience about developing more of a never give up attitude let's let's go there um, okay uh, well I mean the first thing I always say is, is gratitude you know I always tell people to make Amen a, to that. well I always tell people to make a gratitude list A to Z as that which I started during my 27th surgery when I had no hope at all but when I made them every day I found that they were actually pointing to what my values were. And I think we lose faith in ourselves and we want to give up when we forget who we are, you know, and then, you know, once we forget who we are, we don't know how to make decisions anymore. Um, so so once I started doing these gratitude lists, I, I saw like recurring themes and what I was grateful for. Um, and, and I realized, oh, you know, okay, nature is important to me. A family is important to me. And that gave me confidence that, you know what, no matter what my life circumstances, you know, uh, this is what I'm about. And that gave me confidence to know the universal truth that any choice is right because you made it. You know, and I think we all just need the, 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 confidence, the confidence to do that. Um, so that, that really helped me. Um, another thing was, you know, creativity, as we had mentioned, um, and then, um, and then the idea of that, like a vessel to uh, share our story. That we need that creativity to to kind of get us out there um, and help us find that common ground with other people. Absolutely. What are you most proud of out of everything you've accomplished in the last ten years since your surgery, your first surgery? What are you most proud of? What am I most proud of? Um. I'm proud that I, you know, even that, that, you know what, I'm proud that I had my bad days and I still have them and I'm able to kind of take a breath and restock and, and keep going forward. And, you know, because things will always happen, you know. Absolutely. I, I, everybody. I just did my TED talk about how the ending was this like marriage and I'm dealing with a divorce this month, you know, so it's like, you know, life is constantly putting us on our toes and, and I'm proud of myself that I, now the difference is I let myself feel those things and I get upset and I know that I've gotten upset in the past and I think the important thing is that I remember all those awful feelings and I also know that, you know, they can, they will pass. Got it. Um, I'm sorry to hear about the divorce. It's it. it okay. What drives you? What what do you find? Where do you find your inspiration? You were talking about your values and your priorities. Are those your inspiration, or do you have a specific person, or or thing that that drives you that that inspires you every day? Well, I think since you mentioned other people, like the first thing, in, like one thing that I can never not mention is. You know, I'm lucky that I have a, a ridiculously supportive family. I have, um, you know, parents, parents and three brothers that, you know, listen, I was in the ICU from 
ages 18 to like 22 you're at the hospital and I never I hardly spent one night in the hospital by myself so like that's one thing I'm lucky for that I've had I have good childhood memories to draw back from and you know I I have that good foundation and I've never you know I'm so lucky because I know that listen I've been through hard times but also you know not a lot of people have what I have um, so I'm very lucky. So I think that's my biggest inspiration. And that's like a gratitude that, you know, you, you can't get rid of. Because I, I mean, I have like just, you know, amazing support. You know, I have a family that would do anything for me. And, and I have, you know, and, I, you know, my body, my body is so inspiring. God, it's been through hell. And I can tap dance and, you know, and everything that I thought I'd never be able to do. Got it. Um, so... We've talked about your favorite books, and not favorite books. You've talked about two of the books that you like most. Um, yes. Do you have other books that you'd like to recommend for people or something that you like to buy for people as a gift? Well, for trauma, I would say The Body Keeps the Score by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. It is such a comprehensive book for not just – definitely not just for people that have been through trauma. I bought – it for like my family as well because it is such a good understanding and also comes across like it talks about like the various it talks about how theater and dance and group activities are not used enough for trauma and that you know like the Greek play like Sophocles and a lot of things like that were originally used for military veterans as a way to reintegrate back to society so it's just a very comprehensive fascinating view um, for, for creativity um, I don't know if you've read Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert but I think anyone that's even thought about being creative or maybe some kind of artist thing it's it's the perfect mix of like inspiration and tough love um, I mean so that that was a really great book and uh, hey and mine which should be available by the end of next year <laughs> but, <laughs> looking um, forward to that one Amy that's for sure and, and definitely Waking the Tiger, I could recommend a million times by Peter Levine. It's definitely on the, on the, on, at the bottom of the podcast. Everybody's going to be able to, to see the links to the book Great. and read them. Um, a couple more questions. What surprised you um, about people? So what is something that you, that you found that's surprising about people in general? Like, what surprises you the most about people? What surprises me the most about That, you know what, actually... <laughs> that everyone's been through something and it you know it's amazing that if you're honest enough um people will, will open up like you know I felt such like shame almost in high school like I was crazy um but um you know now suddenly people are reaching out to me on Facebook like oh I read your story and and um you know and and realizing that you know everyone's been through something Got it. Absolutely. And the last question, is there something that I, that I should have asked, but I didn't? Is there a question that you want? Is there something you want to talk about that I didn't bring up? Well, uh, why is trauma important for everyone to know about? Let's talk about that. And that's actually the inspiration behind my new drama that I've written, which is based off of my brother's journal entries when I was in the ICU and also my own healing process, um, where I'm played actually by two people, where the protagonist is, um, you know, two of me trying to, you know, the past and the present. And it, it, it shows how, you know, healing is a society effort. I mean, it's amazing what shame and stigma can do to make someone regress in the healing process. And that's not to make us all victims like, oh, I can't heal unless you understand me. But you know what? It is it is traumas. It is our job as a community. I think we should all know what PTSD is and symptoms like, you know, uh, dissociation. Yes. And. I mean, I would, you know, the body keeps a score. Some of it's a little dense, but um, it's worth reading. My favorite part of that is at the end, he said, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, he says, I was giving a lecture and someone said to me, do you mind just not talking about the whole kind of social aspect? Can you just do like the psychological part? You know, as if traumas exist in the bathroom, yeah. keep them in their cage and don't deal with them. So I think that, like, we all need to understand, because you know what, whether it's a life-altering trauma or a little thing we don't even realize we're going through, people need, that that awareness is so key to everything. It, it affects every aspect of your life, absolutely every it's, aspect. And you might not even know it, so the best thing we can do is be informed. Absolutely, be informed and talk to a shrink if you can, and, and find an outlet for Find a needed outlet, yes. yes. 
So what are you doing right now? What 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 are you excited about right now? What are you working on right now, Amy? Well, I'm premiering my 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 uh, play Imprints, which is the play I was mentioning. Hopefully in New York in January. Amazing. Um, which is like an uh, eight-character ensemble piece. Yeah, amazing, but I might not have the funding, so I have a Patreon account. We'll, and we'll, we'll help you with that. We'll... Oh, help me out. I, I <laughs> love help because um, I want to make this happen. Um, and, um, and I'm trying to finish out my book. And I'll, I'm still touring my one-woman musical, Gutless and Grateful, to presentations and conferences and, and all that, um, and theaters. Um, I'll be doing it again uh, in February in New York and, and all over. Um, so, you know, I'm staying busy. <laughs> so those are your plans. We've actually covered the book that's coming out next year sometime? Yes. You, yep. You're going to have the show starting. You're in the middle of the show right now. Are you, are you in production in, in PA right now or no? Uh, we're waiting for money. <laughs> okay. All right. So, but you and, and I'm doing that. my show, Gutless and Grateful, next in February. In uh, amazing. So, Amy, thank you so very much thank for being so on podcast. the podcast today. And I know you're very busy, and I know you need to run. But how can the audience get in touch with you today? Well, you know, how can they get in touch with you? Subscribe to my newsletter, amyoes. dot com slash newsletter, and just subscribe. Send me a note. I'm on Twitter way too much, uh, at A-M-Y-O-E-S. Um, I'm, I'll give you a link to my Patreon account, uh, Patreon slash email. But um, definitely send me a note through my website. Um, I also have a weekly detours feature where every week um, anyone with a detour in their life can write in about anything that's happened. And biggest takeaway here, you have a story worth sharing. Don't tell me, oh my God, your my story looks like crap compared to yours. We've all been through something and it is all worth validating. So please be empowered by my story. Don't be inspired. Well, you can be inspired too, but, but have the confidence to know that we all deserve healing. Absolutely. And uh, we'll have all the, Amy's contact information at the bottom of the podcast. So spread so that. It's all going to be there. You will be able to help her with um, her Money. play. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, get in touch with her and see if she needs any kind of other help that you might be able to offer. And reach out to sure. her if you have a detour story for sure. Thanks, Amy, again, and see you all next <laughs> See you all next time. See you. Bye. Bye. Top of the world. Top of the Hi again, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. The music for our podcast is graciously provided by our very own Wonder Woman, Cheryl B. Engelhart. Check out her music and get your free music bundle at cbemusic.com. We hoped you liked our conversation with Amy Ostracker, as rich with meaning and passion as it was. We need to remember one of the most important lessons of today's podcast, and that is grit, and also the power of art as healing medium for all of us. Art does matter. Remember to head on over to ifundwomen.com project forward slash business dash magazine dash women or check out the bottom on the right side of the video and check out our project and invest in us so that we can continue to showcase the women that will inspire this and the next generation. Looking forward to seeing you all next time. This is Wonder Women Podcast. We're signing off and see you all next week. Bye.